and by the end of the 19th century, British soldiers returning home from the Indian-Afghanistan wars brought several specimens with them. The breed began to attract widespread attention in the 1920s, both in England and the United States, and was admitted to AKC registration in 1926. You'll be seeing many Afghan hounds during this presentation. Some are outstanding examples of the breed, others are less so. The Afghan hound is an aristocrat, his whole appearance one of dignity and aloofness. There is no trace of plainness or coarseness. He has a proudly carried head, eyes gazing into the distance as if in memory of ages past. The striking characteristics of the breed stand out clearly the exotic or eastern expression, long silky topknot, peculiar coat pattern, very prominent hip bones, large feet, and the impression of a somewhat exaggerated bend in the stifle due to profuse trouserings. These unique characteristics, which have held true to tradition throughout the ages, give the Afghan hound the appearance of being a king of dogs. Remember that, as with any coated breed, a hands-on examination is essential. Your evaluation must include feeling under the coat for proper structure and balance. In outline, the Afghan is square and more compact and angular than other sighthounds. Dogs stand 27 inches at the withers, plus or minus one inch, while bitches stand 25 inches, also plus or minus an inch. Dogs weigh about 60 pounds, bitches about 50. The Afghan is not a wispy or weedy breed nor is it meant to have coarseness unbefitting its gaze hound character. Any great size variation must be handled as any other deviation from the standards requirements. Let's begin our detailed examination of the Afghan with the head. It is of good length, showing much refinement, the skull evenly balanced with the foreface there is a slight prominence of the nasal bone structure, causing a slightly Roman appearance. The center line runs up over the foreface with little or no stop, falling away in front of the eyes, so there is an absolutely clear outlook with no interference. The underjaw shows great strength. The jaws are long and punishing. The occipital bone is very prominent, but is not easily seen as the head is surmounted by a top knot of long, silky hair. Seen from the front, the widest part of the skull is at the zygomatic arch, which should be smooth, not pronounced. This is the bony ridge forming the lower border of the eye socket and running to the ear opening. In humans, it is the cheekbone. This head is correct, long and spare, with no excess flesh, and with the skull and muzzle evenly balanced. The muzzle is characterized by long, punishing jaws. 
The jaws taper somewhat toward the nose, with the underjaw showing great strength. To be faulted are coarse heads or muzzles that are too refined or snipey. The importance of large, powerful teeth and a tight, punishing bite cannot be overemphasized in a hunting hound. Both the level bite, where the edges of the teeth of the upper jaw and lower jaw meet evenly, and the scissors bite, where the edges of the teeth of the upper jaw just overlap the edges of the teeth of the lower jaw, are efficient tools and are acceptable. The teeth should not be crowded together. An undershot or overshot bite is a fault, as is any sign of a shallow, very narrow, or poorly fitting underjaw. The Afghan's eyes are almond-shaped, almost triangular. They should never be full or bulging. They are dark in color and should be deeply set. Being far-sighted, the Afghan will often pull his head back when focusing on close objects. This gives the aloof and often arrogant look of the breed. Proper eye shape, color, and set help produce the typical Afghan expression aloof and dignified. These eyes are correct. Almond-shaped, deeply set, and dark in color. The nose is of good size and black in color. The ears are long, set approximately on a level with the outer corners of the eyes, with the leathers nearly reaching to the end of the nose. They are covered with long, silky hair, that can sometimes be of considerable length. This well-balanced head is pleasing and true to breed type, showing refinement with the characteristic eastern expression, almond-shaped eyes, a low ear set, long ear fringes, and the profuse top knot required by the standard. Now let's consider the Afghan hound's neck and body. The neck is of good length and is strong and arched. It runs in a curve to the shoulders, which are long, sloping, and well laid back. The quest for a long, strong neck with an arched nape is common to all sight hounds. Together with a muscular widening towards the shoulders, it makes up the external profile. It is essential for balance and the holding of game. A faulty U-neck is concave in its upper surface. The long, thinly muscled gooseneck does not properly widen. The amount and patterning of coat affects the neck appearance. A thick coat, especially, can make a neck look shorter than it actually measures. This neck is of proper length, curving to the shoulders, which are long, sloping, and well laid back, with upper arms of equal length angled well back so that the forelegs are set well under the dog. Correct angulation of the forequarters should be such that a line dropped from the top of the shoulder blade to the ground should graze the back edge of the elbow. The forelegs themselves are straight and strong, with great length between the elbow and pastern. The pastern slopes somewhat, placing the heel pad under the dog's center of gravity. The front feet should turn neither in nor out. They are large, both in length and width. With well-arched toes, and unusually large pads. They're covered with thick, fine hair. Feet are to be large in every direction as specified, with thick, rough, non-skid pads. The texture, amount, and length of foot coat can create the illusion of feet that are much larger or much smaller than hand inspection proves. This dog appears too straight in shoulder, which can cause the dog to break down in pastern, 
which is a serious fault. This dog's shoulders are correctly angulated and obliquely placed with sufficient length of upper arm or humerus assuring plenty of reach in front. The legs are set well under the dog with the length from the top of the shoulder blade to the point of shoulder being nearly equal to that from the point of shoulder to the elbow. Viewed from the front, the legs are straight and strong, with the elbows well held in. The chest is well filled in, and should be about the width of a hand between the legs, with the four ribs joining in a strong sternum. As mentioned earlier, the Afghan's body is square and angular in outline with the height of the shoulders equaling the distance from the chest to the buttocks. The ratio of height to body length describes a square dog, which with high head carriage and a strong level back appears more compact than other sight hounds. The back line should appear practically level from shoulders to loins, which are strong, powerful, and comparatively short. The brisket is well let down and of medium width. The rib cage is long and well sprung and tucked up in the flanks. Although not mentioned in the standard, a slight dent behind the withers due to a change in direction of vertebral spines should not be mistaken for a swayback. The top line is spare, broken by prominent hip bones which are accentuated by the saddle coat pattern. This dog's top line is practically level, neither running uphill nor downhill. The powerful muscling on the sides and top of the loins should not be mistaken for a roach. The croup falls away from the hip bones with the distance from croup to tail being about a hand's width. The tail is an extension of the spinal column and should not be set too high on the body. It has a ring or curve at the end, but should never be curled over or rest on the back or be carried sideways. Nor should the tail be bushy. The tail is carried up when the dog is in motion, but need not be held up by the exhibitor when the dog is stationary. The standard calls for the tail to be up only when the dog is in motion. Hindquarters are powerful and well muscled, with great length between the hip and the hock. The hocks are well let down. There should be good angulation of stifle and hock. Angulation of the hind leg refers to the degree of flexion at the knee and must be hand checked. In profile, the hind leg segment from seat bone to stifle should equal the length from stifle to hock joint. Of prime importance is that this angulation is in balance with the front angulation. Bear in mind that the drape of coat and artful grooming can produce illusionary effects. Also remember that the impression of a somewhat exaggerated bend in the stifle is only due to coat. The dog should not be overangulated. The rear feet are broad and of good length, although not quite as large as the front feet. They are covered with long, thick hair. Feet thrown outward or inward, thin pads or small feet, or any other weakness of the feet are to be faulted. Seen from the rear, the hindquarters resemble a wishbone with the broad pelvis setting the hip bones wide apart. The appearance of the legs being bowed from hock to crotch comes from muscle mass on the upper and lower thighs in conjunction with a broad pelvis. The hind legs are straight and long, with low, tight hocks held parallel to each other, turning neither in nor out. Sickle hocks, 
cowhawks, or longhawks are faulty. The Afghan hound's coat is its crowning glory and should be shown in its natural state with no clipping or trimming. The hindquarters, flanks, ribs, forequarters, and legs are well covered with thick, silky hair, which is very fine in texture. The ears and all four feet are well feathered. The hair is short and close from in front of the shoulders and back from the shoulders along the saddle, from the flanks and the ribs upward. The smooth back is a characteristic of the mature Afghan hound, as is the top knot of long, silky hair surmounting the head. Lack of a short-haired saddle is a fault on a mature dog. Short hair in the form of cuffs on the front and rear legs is traditional and enhances the appearance of the dog. The Afghan hound should be shown in its natural state. The coat is not clipped or trimmed. The traditional pattern of a short-haired face, saddle and neck is for a mature hound, sometimes arriving at three months of age and sometimes not for two and a half years. Over-anxious exhibitors will artfully trim a saddle on a young dog for the show ring, a flagrant violation of the standards calling for a natural dog. As a dog matures, each change of coat in length, texture, and pattern will affect the appearance of his outline. The judge must understand these changes and learn to look through the coat rather than simply at it. As for color, any color is permissible, with pleasing colors or color combinations being especially attractive. Although no color is given preference, white markings are not considered desirable especially blazes and other white markings on the head. A chest locket is acceptable. The Afghan hound moves with great style and beauty. When running free, the dog runs at a gallop, showing great elasticity and spring in a smooth, powerful stride. The Afghan hound's own stock in trade is unparalleled agility, a legacy from a country of stony, hilly, and sometimes slippery terrain. He must have powerful forequarters and thrusting rear quarters that take him up slopes and over broken ground with great bursts of speed. This special agility is manifest at the trot by a seemingly weightless quality, showing elasticity and spring, giving the impression of the body floating above well-jointed legs moving in great springy strides. Trotting in the ring on a loose lead, he should step along with head and tail high and with the appearance of placing the hind feet directly in the footprints of the forefeet. Coming toward you, the front leg should converge in a straight line toward a central line of travel, the degree of convergence dependent upon the speed of the dog. going away, the rear legs also converge toward the center line of travel, retaining a straight line from hips to pads. The balanced afghan will have the same degree of convergence fore and aft. Here is typical movement, 
what has been termed balanced collection. The body compact, with back level, head up, and tail high. Gating on a loose lead is essential to your evaluation. Pulling ahead at the end of a tight lead, with the body long and low, rather than balanced and compact, is in direct conflict with the standard and the hunting essence of the breed. Finally, a word about temperament. The Afghan is typically aloof and discriminating with strangers, but devoted, gay, affectionate, even clownish at times with those he knows and trusts. Any sign of sharpness or aggression, or conversely shyness or timidity toward strangers is not to be tolerated. The Afghan hound possesses the powerfully balanced body and mind needed to pursue the functions of a working sighthound. And his countenance and attitude are the epitome of regal bearing and graceful dignity.